Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting our students to learn what we teach. And I am Rob Alvarez. I'm the founder of Professor Game and professor of gamification and games-based solutions at IE Business School, EFMD, EBS University, and many other places around the world. And if this content is for you, then please go ahead and subscribe to our email list for free at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, and welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. We have Terry with us today, but Terry, we need to know, are you prepared to engage? Absolutely, Bob. Well. <laughs> Let's do this. We have Terry Pierce with us, and he has been a consultant in learning and development for over 20 years, and he specializes in creating and facilitating games-based and gamified learning experiences. He's the founder of Untold Play, by which he works with clients of all kinds to help make their learning experiences as gameful as possible. He's also also the creator of the Transform Deck, which is a games-based tool to inspire learning designers and creators to make their learning experiences more activity-led and learner-focused. It's being used to do just that in more than 20 countries worldwide. His current focus on his framework, The Six Levers of Game-Based Learning, is a tool to help learning designers and creators to take inspiration from what works in games and apply it to their learning experiences. He writes and speaks regularly on games-based learning and gamification in as many places as he can, including BookBoon, the world's largest corporate library provider, and a Spiel Digital and the Playful Creative Summit. We actually met also in the Game-Based Learning Alliance, and I'm sure there's many more to come, Terry, but... Is there anything that we're missing that we should mention before we get into the questions? No, I don't think so. I mean, it sounds great coming from you. I, I think I need you to introduce me every time I turn up to somewhere. Amazing. Amazing. So Terry, what does a regular day with you look like? It seems you're very busy with different things. So we want to get a feel of, of what that looks like. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'll do my best because I, I don't think there is, for me, a regular day. I, I very much kind of like <laughs> to go with the flow a little bit of what's working for me at the time. But I mean, the one thing that probably would be in common is starting early. I think I definitely do my most creative work in the morning. So I'm usually at my desk pretty early. And if I've got to do some writing, if that's the project that I'm working on, or some design and, and coming up with some creative ideas, perhaps to meet a brief for a client, then that's what I'll be doing in the morning. And then if there's something that's a little bit more process driven, so if I've, you know, if I've got a basic design, but now I've just got to fill in the fields on some cards or go through and execute on a plan that I've actually come up with, then that'll be a more of an afternoon thing. So I'll try and slot that in there. I guess the other thing that I really like to do in the afternoon that's kind of really works for me and, and my rhythms is collaboration. So if I'm trying to put in meetings with other professionals, games-based professionals, then the afternoon I find that I can really do that. And then that leaves my precious morning time for me to really get creative and throw ideas about and come up with stuff. <laughs> Amazing. It, you know, for going with the flow, it seems to be quite, um, I don't want to say like super structured or, or formal, but it, it does sound like you do have some process and some stuff figured out already <laughs> as to how you expect your days to go, which is great. I'm not saying anything against that. I love it. So actually, let's dive into one of our favorite moments, which is the fail or first attempt in learning. Can you talk to us about one of those times in doing what you do in game-based learning and gamification? Things just didn't go your way, and we want to be there with you. We want to take the lessons. We want to have the full deal. Sure, yeah. I mean, one that comes to mind in particular is, so I did a 24-hour game design marathon. Well, I mean, I decided it was going to be a game design marathon. It was a marathon anyway, kind of one of these things where you sign up and everyone's trying to do something really, um, you know, <laughs> that would be a good achievement within 24 hours. And, and I took on designing a learning game, which is quite a lot to do in 24 hours. But I wanted to do it as a kind of experience, something to see how that kind of pressure pushed me on and, and what kind of things happened. And I think I actually got really, really kind of quite well into creating a game based around motivation in the workplace and helping people who might be playing it understand how to motivate their teams and their people. But, you know, it was quite time pressured. And I think what I didn't really leave time for before the play test at the very end of the 24 hours was thinking about the rules and the teach and, and the experience of learning how to play the game for the players. And so what seemed to me 
not that complex a game because I'd been through the whole process of putting it together and thinking about all of the different systems that are involved in it. Suddenly, as soon as I was actually in the middle of starting the, the playtest by explaining to them how to play, I realized it was just too much, just kind of eyes starting to glaze over a little bit, a bit of confusion. And this was a little, bit, a little while ago. And, and even back then, that's not, and I wouldn't really have, have done things that way normally. I would have spent more time and thinking about the player journey. But I think it, it really brought home to me just how important it was to think about the fact that the, the kind of rules or instructions or teach might be kind of last for you, but it's first for someone who's coming to your game or your experience. So I think that really drove home for me just how important it is to think of things in terms of their journey and also try to use as many different ways as possible to think about what's the best way for them to take on the how-to. So things like just-in-time instructions rather than everything up front or things mm -hmm. like player aids or prompts that are in the right place at the right time and trying to make things visual, things like that. <laughs> it's one of those things that I, I like... I can feel you there in that simplifying the, the way that you do the onboarding or giving the instructions. And it's something I usually lead by saying in workshops and so on, but it's so easy to forget, like no matter how many times you've seen it or you've done it, right? <laughs> there, there, it's also easy to forget how, how simple it is to sit down and play a video game. Board games are, are a little bit of a special category there, right? Because you have the instructions and so on. And even like that, people go to YouTube videos and, and, and mm. do it faster, right? But yeah. I don't know, it's... It, there is a tendency for us to to over complicate and try to upfront everything. I'm I'm not sure what that comes from. Like now you're saying it, and my mind is racing around. Like why why do we end up going in that direction? Really? Like even when we know that's that's probably not the best place to to get started. But anyways, thanks for those lessons. That was amazing, Terry. So let's actually how about we turn that around and and, and think of a time when things actually went great. Like. Again, on the first or the nth attempt, after iteration, whatever that looks like, we want to be there and maybe take away some of those success factors, if we can call them that way. Yeah, sure. So I think actually creating the Transform deck was, in a way, me solving a challenge with games-based learning and certainly something that I'm really pleased with how it went. So I think it came out of a desire for me to share my experience in designing playful, activity-based, experiential learning and, and all my the techniques that I've used over the years to design sessions that were really or experiences that were really engaging and got learners involved. And you know, I've done this in various ways with kind of workshops and, and other things that are designed to try and pass on some of those ideas and, and abilities and also writing about it, coaching people on it. But I, I think I wanted something that was a little bit more of something people could use as and when they needed it, a tool. And I don't think I really expressed that need in my own mind initially, but what I was starting to do was play around with a lot of the different ways that I turned learning content into different kinds of activity or games or playful experiences over the years and just try and put some kind of structure on it, try and categorize things, different ways that I'd, I'd approached it. And as I started to do this, because I was leaving it, I think, over time and letting it percolate, letting it just drift around in my mind and think, how's the best way to do this? These different categories and different ideas of types of activity or ways to transform content into experiences, first of all, became a spreadsheet and <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, it was really useful for me. I was finding this spreadsheet really useful of, you know, if I was looking for an idea, a way to rapidly iterate and look down different ones and reject and, and accept things that would would move things forwards. And then I kind of hit on the idea that because I'm a real big fan of card decks and the power that you can get from playing around with cards and moving them around. I don't know if you know that Dmitry Mendeleev created the periodic table by doing that with the elements on different cards and moving them around and looking at their different properties and realizing what the patterns and connections were. So, you know, I've always loved those kinds of ideas and ways of doing things. And just this kind of connection I made that actually if I turned each of these ideas of different ways to transform learning content into a card, then I and other people would be able to play with those cards and look around, sort and sift them in different ways until I could find the one 
that would really be right for their particular piece of learning content. So that kind of process of doing it quite, you know, letting it percolate and letting it find its own path, but then using my inspirations, such as my obsession, I guess, with cards uh, (laughs) to give it some shape, really in the end, I think, resulted in in a product that, that I was really happy with. But as I've gone out and introduced it to the wider world, I've had some really great and satisfying feedback on people coming back to me and saying that it's really helped them to get their ideas into something that really works. Amazing. And there could be like a million questions I could ask about this for sure. But the main one is if somebody was trying to sort of, because I I feel that what you're saying from this one is, amongst other things, is that sort of your life's work in a way was poured into this, into this endeavor, right? Like in many ways, it's like, well, all I've been doing, I, I like to let it be there for somebody else whenever they need and, and I'm not around. And again, not to be you know, sort of make it about life and when life ends, and nothing of the sort. It's just, you know, when you're not around or you're, you already mm. consulted them and they still need some help or whatever that looks like, right? Yeah. Um, if somebody was trying to do something maybe along those lines, is there any recommendation you, you think you could provide in that sense from your experience from, again, from doing what you have done at this stage? Uh, you mean turning their life's work into something like that? Yeah, may- yeah. maybe creating a card deck. Mm-hmm. Again, because sometimes like creating the card deck and, and a game-based learning through cards, I'm sure is, is something that you can definitely, like you've done before and you've helped yeah. people do that. And that's part of the work that we frequently do. But if it goes to sort of a further impact in that way, like they want to turn the, their, their again, maybe their life's work or, or something very important to them into this kind of, game or, or game-based learning of, of cards in particular, is there any recommendation that you would like to make sure like people don't forget about doing or whatever? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. A couple of things I would say, don't rush ahead too fast to the final product. Definitely. Um, hmm. you know, the, what I created had iterations through two different spreadsheets and various other documents to, I think, four different drafts of the cards themselves. So, you know, let the kind of process find its own way, I guess is one thing I'd say. But also I think about the affordances, and and I know that's quite a kind of technical word in a way, but, you know, what is something like a card, or if you're using something else, not a card, a board game or whatever, what are the things that it really excels at, that it allows you to do or allows other people to do? I think I was really guided by that in my process, thinking about what are cards allow people to do. For instance, they allow people to lay things out in a spread in front of them or to shuffle and look at one and focus on one thing. Okay, so if that's what they're good at, if that's what they help people to do, how can I really lean into that and take advantage of that? That's really important. Like thinking about the affordances, as you were just saying, I think that that's that's crucial, especially when thinking about different forms or modalities of game-based learning and whatnot. So thank you very much for those recommendations. No problem. And Terry, again, with the experience that you've got, all the stuff that you've done at this point, I'm sure that there are ways for you to do things. And this kind of maybe includes a little bit of what we were discussing before about your card deck, right? So sure. what's your process? When, when you're faced with a challenge that maybe has to do with game-based learning, gamification, how do you do it? Like, what are the steps? Give us a little bit of insights or, or tell us how do your cards work so that we can look into that further? I don't know, like whatever, wherever you want to go for. Sure, yeah. I mean, I do have a kind of process from end to end. It gets quite flexible, especially in the middle. But I think that it's actually not, massively dissimilar from i was listening to uh some of your episodes from july last year um july 23 around kind of gamification process five-step process and it's a really sound kind of idea and and mine's quite similar it is really being very clear and, and making sure i'm clear up front on the who who's going to be doing the learning why what it's intended to achieve and the what what is it that we've actually got to transfer in terms of skills or knowledge or whatever and then after that, I guess this is where it gets a little bit more open, but often there is a period, if I can afford it, of letting it sit and just allowing myself, you know, I'm a great believer in that, that as soon as you've got a problem on your mind or a challenge on your mind, things will fit into it. So it's there, it's at the back of my brain, and I'm looking around me for inspiration, ideally, and that inspiration might come from my board game shelf, it might come from my Steam library, it might come there definitely from a framework, and often I will kind of cycle through different frameworks and different tools. So the Transform Deck definitely would be one of them, but also things like Yukai Chow's Octalysis Framework, Andre Marchewski's Periodic Table, and I think you're using some of that actually in your model as well. 
for depending on what stage I'm in or what kind of thing it is, whether it's more gamification or whether it's more games-based learning, maybe Nicole Lazaro's Four Keys to Fun. So a lot of different kind of frameworks that I might just try and get in front of me, see whether they fit in or give me a little bit of inspiration or things like lists of game mechanics, which I've developed the one on Board Game Geeks to my own kind of version of that list, which I use for that. And then I have, as well as the Transformed, I've got another framework that I do use that helps me because I developed it for myself and for my own needs that I call the six levers of games-based learning. So that's a really helpful way for me to kind of summarize some of the things that games do really well that's relevant to learning in particular. Amazing. Amazing. And again, it's from the process you were mentioning, the things that diverge and don't. Where can we find out more about how, how this works? The six levers. Yeah, yeah. How, how you do it. If, there's yeah, any, sure. if there is right. anything online or even yeah, if you have a product, I don't know. How absolutely. do we do that? Yeah. So it's not, it's not a product to search at the moment. At the moment, it's a few different articles, straight essays and webinars. So you can find the article that kind of summarizes the six levers and... It's something I use in webinars and presentations when I do them. So, you know, if anybody's on my, on my mailing list, then they'll find out about those when I'm doing them. But it is something that I'm developing actually into probably a book and certainly an online cohort based course to try and pass on some of those ideas. Um, definitely. Sorry. The other thing I should say is that, you know, it doesn't, this is the middle stage that I'm talking about here. It doesn't end there. Obviously, then there's further stages in my process of, okay, I've got ideas now. Let's, try and narrow it down the other end of the diamond and get it into a final form and play test, play test, get feedback until it's ready. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you very much for that. And Terry, as, as you mentioned, you've listened to a few episodes as well. You've heard the questions more than once. Is there anybody that comes to your mind that you say, well, I'd really like to listen to this person answering these or, or a similar set of questions on the Professor Game podcast. I might be even inspired by listening to this person. Yeah, there is definitely, actually. So C. Tai Nguyen is a professor of philosophy at Utah University, and he has some incredible ideas, I think, about games as a medium, as an artistic medium, the way that he frames it. But I think it's also really relevant to learning. And he talks a lot about sculpting player agency by using some of the key things like which obstacles are you putting in front of people or which goals are you setting huh. within a game. And the ideas that come out of that for me are just really, really inspiring. And he talks about them very, very well. I would love to see him on your podcast. Can you repeat the name? I, I'm not sure I caught it well. Yeah, no problem. C. Tai Nguyen. I think I'm pronouncing that surname right, but C. Tai, T H I <laughs> Nguyen, N G U Y E N. Amazing, amazing. We'll see if we can get in contact with C. Tai Nguyen to see if we can have this person on the podcast. Sounds like a very exciting guest to have. Mm. Sure. And keeping up with the recommendations, what book would you say would be inspiring or interesting for our engagers to have in their bookshelf? Yeah. I mean, if I could recommend a couple, I would go with, so his book, actually, Games Agency as Art, is really, really interesting in terms of expanding some of those ideas that I was just talking about around player agency and around games as a medium in the same way that painting or anything else is a medium. It is, the book itself is on the academic side of things. So if maybe I could offer a, a contrast in terms of a book that I think is really practical and really appealing to anyone, which is, and I know you're aware of this book and you've had Jesse Shell on your show, but The Art of Game Design by Jesse Shell is, to me, an incredible achievement. It's, it just staggers me how big the book is, but <laughs> at the same time, how accessible it is and how full of different ideas. You can just open it to any page and just find inspiration about a different part of considering and producing games. And although he's come from a background of games at, or game-like things at kind of amusement parks and in digital games and computer games, I think the things that I've found out of it are applicable to literally any kind of game that you could imagine. Hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Great recommendations for sure. I'm actually, when you said the book by Jesse Shell, I turned around and looked at it in my, <laughs> in my bookshelf. Lovely book. Amazing guest as well, if you want to listen to his episode. Yeah, no, I did listen to the episode. Really good. Yeah, he's amazing. Absolutely. And his studio has, I mean, you can probably still consider him an indie studio, but it's already like a lot more than what you, you when you think of an indie studio, it's not <laughs> like it's not what he's managed to have in this period uh, at this point. Like they, they already do games for Nintendo Switch and that kind mm. of stuff. Like they're, they're, they've really been growing 
significantly and i'm i'm, I'm amazed and, and happy about the fact that they've been able to do that like you know there's a german expression i'm sure i'm getting it wrong or I, i'm probably not pronouncing it well or that's not even the word it's schadenfreude or something like that which is you know when people right. enjoy of seeing others suffer <laughs> there, there's the exact opposite of that I, i've heard this i don't know exactly what the word is through meditation and, and buddhist traditions mm. there's the opposite of that well I feel the, the exact opposite of Schadenfreude when, when I see Jesse's and, and the Shell Studio achievements. It's like, wow, amazing. Like, it's great to see that can actually happen. <laughs> so, yeah, there is a word for that. I can't think what it is, but yeah, that's great. There's, uh, I think, and again, it was a long time ago that I did these courses and I haven't meditated in a while, especially since we, we have our kid at home. I don't find the time as I used to, but it could be loving kindness or something along those lines of the translation to English. But uh, yeah, it's mudita or something like that. Like it, it's starting to come, but I'm not sure. I, but that's exactly the way I, like the best way for me to describe when I see that mm. kind of achievement is absolutely that. Like I, of course, you would like to be a part of it. I'm not a part of his, his achievement in any way. But, you know, it's 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 exciting to see that. It actually inspires me to say, I like, oh, that, that's really available. It's not just the big, you know, big mm. firms that have been around for so long and that do the best and the worst practices, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're it's accessible. Saying, you're saying you're not a part of it, but I think if you recommend it and if you engage with it, then in a way you are a part of it. I, I recommended that book to a mm. colleague in the games, games based learning space, and she was completely inspired by it. And she came back and thanked me for introducing the book to her. And that made me feel yeah. in some small yeah. way a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm happy to be a part, of, especially in the sense of sort of collaborating and so on. But it's one thing to, to be that. And another one is to like, I, I, I actually, I realized after I had Jesse on the show, after I've been following him for years, I realized a former colleague from the university that she was, I think she's not anymore. She's a programmer as myself, but I never really dedicated to programming, but that's what I studied, computer engineering, that she was actually working <laughs> at the studio. It's like, wow, <laughs> amazing. So she actually was like literally a part, like she can say, oh, that, you know, that game or that thing that was there. I was mm -hmm. like, I, I actually did some stuff in there, which I'm sure is definitely a, a proud thing for her to be able to say. So th th that's what I meant. Definitely. Uh, I've recommended Jesse not enough <laughs> for sure. sure and his book but plenty of times because i know the, the work there is absolutely amazing mm. so thanks for that for sure terry and we talked about other people and we've talked about your products so what would you say is that thing that you excel at that thing that you do better than most not necessarily than everyone maybe it is maybe not but some people feel like humbled when i ask this question just to make sure it's, it's a superpower but it doesn't have to be exclusive you don't have to be the only one i, I just Sort of want to get a feel of what you have seen is that thing that you do in this world of gamification and game-based learning that helps you stand out from, from what other great work other people are doing as well. Yeah, I have remembered you asking this question from previous shows and I was thinking what I would, what I would answer. I, I'm, not, I'm not one for <laughs> blowing my own trumpet, actually. But I guess one thing that I do recognize in myself and I see it helping me when I'm creating game-based learning is seeing patterns and connections I think I'm always seeing patterns and connections between things, ways that things are related. And sometimes it drives my wife crazy because I'm singing one song over the top of another <laughs> because I've just realized they use the same chords or interrupting the film to say where the actor comes from. But in a game-based learning context, I think it really comes into its own because there's things like seeing patterns in the reality or the work that you're trying to put into some kind of simulation or games-based version of, or seeing patterns and connections between the challenge that's in front of you in terms of creating a game-based solution to something and some of the things that you do, some of the things that you play, some of the games that you play and how they could match or how one could connect with the other. So I think, yeah, seeing patterns and connections between things and bringing things together or finding a way to make something fit with something else. Fantastic and super useful <laughs> superpower. That's that's for sure. And Terry, what would you say is your favorite game? Again, I'm really, really tough to kind of narrowing things down. I can probably narrow it down <laughs> to my favorite computer-based game or my favorite board game. Computer, it would be Baldur's Gate 3, which won Game of the Year this year. So it's not a uh, left field choice, but absolutely, I think one of the reasons it's been so popular is it really, it does the story thing so well. It makes it feel like your story more than any other kind of interactive story-based game that I've seen. So many different branching paths of narrative that seem to connect 
much further down the road in a way that, that is just an amazing achievement. And I guess in terms of a board game, a really, really big fan of the zoo game, Ark Nova, because I think there's a really, really nice mechanic in that with the actions that you take, which engages you and makes you really, really think every turn and look forward to every turn about, oh, how am I going to use my different action options in the most beneficial way? Hmm. Good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. So actually, we do have a little bit of time to go for the random question, which we haven't done in a bit. So Terry, let's find a random question that suits your profile. Great. And bring it in. So yes, we have, well, I, this is a general one, but I'm sure you can have a good go at this one, which is Kalen Huntress is asking, which technique is all hype and doesn't actually work? What do you say to that? Oh, that's an interesting one. Which technique is all hype? I'm not, yeah, I, I'm struggling to think of something that fits the question exactly, but I guess the thing that comes to mind most readily is getting bogged down in mechanics or, or theme, to be honest, um, but getting bogged down in, in the, <laughs> the bells and whistles and, and what kind of things we could have in the game, what kind of things we could get people to do, what kind of amazing systems we could have, which I think is all in opposition to, uh, or, 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 you know, or just how could we make them have lots of fun, which is all <laughs> in, in, perks. <laughs> yeah, which is all in opposition to elegance and simplicity in achieving what you're supposed to be here to achieve, which is usually, in our, in our case, to help people learn. Certainly, fun and engagement is usually going to be a big plank of that to not get caught up with all of those different shiny things that, that make you feel really great about having designed something quite complex or fun or impressive looking and focus on what job are we here to do and what's the most elegant way to do it. So basically looking at <laughs> too much of the mechanics and the perks and the stuff, which sounds like it, often it, when you when you get a client or somebody who's looking into this they're they're thinking of the shiny things mm. usually <laughs> that's what they're thinking of and uh, at least i don't know if your experience is similar but it's hard to get them to concentrate on like yeah yeah well, we can do this or that but what is it that you want actually to achieve and then we'll see if a racing car theme is the <laughs> thing that you need yeah. which you saw it work with this you know I use this example a lot. <laughs> Sales team and racing cars and very competitive bunch. Mm. Your team is an R&D group of scientists. I don't know if racing cars is going to be. Maybe it is. Don't get me wrong. Mm. Let, let, let's understand what it is that you want to get from this bunch rather than jump on, you know, whatever it is, that example that you saw somewhere else to f make it, you know, sort of figure out really what it is that you need. So I, I, I love your answer. But again, I don't know if that's been your experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, part of that comes down to, you know, how are people measured or how are they rated? What do they care about? And I think sometimes people don't necessarily spend as much time as they should on measuring whether something really had the impact it was supposed to. And instead, they're thinking about how will it play with some of the people that I need to be talking to on a day to day basis? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Terry, we're running towards the end now. Is there anywhere you want to lead us? Any, I don't know, any links where we can find out more about you? Do you have any final piece of advice? I don't know. It's your time. You know, it's sort of a free microphone at this point before we go to game over. Yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of advice, my advice to anybody who is creating games-based learning or anything related is play. Play as much and as many different. One of the things I've really found is inspiration can pop up in some really strange places and you know i'm <laughs> obsessed with computer games and board games but sometimes you know i'll just be playing just a, a, a kid's game with one of my nephews and i'll suddenly think hey there's something about this game which is why it's stood the test of time as a game that's passed down from kid to kid so i think there's definitely you know just play as many different things as you can that's in terms of advice um, in terms of connecting i'd love to connect um, people can find me via my website, untoldplay.com, where you could sign up to my mailing list if you like, or feel free to email me at terry at untoldplay.com. Or you can look me up, Terry Pierce, on LinkedIn, and I'd be very happy to connect. Amazing. Thank you very much for all of that, Terry. Definitely a pleasure having you on the podcast. However, Terry and Engagers, as you know, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And if you want more interviews with amazing guests like Terry, please go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started on our email list for free. 
we will be in contact and you'll be the first to know of our opportunities that we offer here on Professor Game and you will definitely be a first to know. And remember, as we always like to remind you, because this helps us continue to build this community of engagers. Before you go on to your next mission, if you haven't already, please subscribe or follow whatever the button looks like on your favorite podcast app. This is totally for free. And listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.